Welcome to Daredevil in the Details, a show that explores and duds on the philosophy and themes of Netflix's Daredevil, a digression collection brought to you by A Method to the Madness and Zero Indent. I'm Walter DC McNeil, and I'm joined as always by Patrick from A Method to the Madness to continue our season three coverage. How how you doing, Pat? How how's how did these episodes find you on this fine Sunday? Um I keep ch- changing my tune every season, I've noticed. <laughs> I have a <laughs> have a recency bias I may have noticed every time I start a new season I'm like oh you know I think actually this might be my favorite season <laughs> um because yeah these episodes slap in a very different way from the from the other seasons uh it's, yeah I want to really yeah. I think that's going to be a really big topic for us in this session because there's a lot to yeah. dig into that's just that I don't think we've seen before really yeah yeah, that, that's the thing. This season is quite novel in the within the scope of like even just all superhero stuff. I've I, I've realized. Um, uh, I have I I have gotten a bit numb to it. Also, is another thing I've noticed. <laughs> I've there there are sort of um, tensions that uh, that are in the scene that I own, that are, I have to really th- do some mental gymnastics to notice. Yeah. Because I've just seen it so many times, yeah. Um, huh. but yeah. I mean, is this you've seen this season a lot? Then this is, I think this is like my fourth time watching this season. Oh, wow, yeah. I think I said yeah. this in season two, but this is my second time watching it. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming in fresh. Yeah, see, that's and yeah. Well, I mean, we'll get into it, but I, uh, there's there's some. It doesn't hit me quite as hard, uh, but it's still really awesome. Uh, yeah. Look, I controversially think that it also may not be hitting you as hard because it. I think these episodes aren't going for those kind of maneuvers. Like they're not going for big punches. They're sort of, you know, a, a lot of people have uh, at the time were quite critical of the length of these seasons, um, and the sort of the length yeah. of the Netflix shows in general. And I think this season in particular was was kind of a tipping point for a lot of people where they went, okay, now it's too much, right? They've they've you know these are too long. Um, there's too much extant material. And I would suspect that it's episodes like episode three, for example, or perhaps more so episode four uh, that we're talking about today, which you could kind of look at and you could easily cut this episode from your show in some senses. Uh, but I think you lose a lot of uh, interesting stuff you get to play with later. Although knowing how much of this season ends up being flashbacks, um, you have to wonder if that isn't some of what you'd excise. But I suppose we'll, we'll get to that when we get to those episodes. But um, today we're talking about episodes, uh, Daredevil Season 3, Episodes 3 and 4. So that's Episodes 29 and 30 um, of Daredevil. Uh, the first episode we're talking about is Episode 3, No Good Deed, written by Sone Hoffman and directed by Jennifer Getzinger. Uh, once again, this is the second ep we've seen from her. So a, re- a recurring face, finally, which is nice to see. Uh, so Pat, could we please... Oh, I should say something too, which is uh, you're getting sleep deprived, David, at the moment. So um, if, th- if there's any typos um, or anything like that, I entirely blame my lack of sleep and not my lack of craftsmanship. Um, so let's hear the summary, Pat. Fisk reels from the Albanian attack, learning that Vanessa is missing. Word of Fisk's release prompts collective and individual action. Protesters gather outside the hotel while Nelson, Murdoch, and Page go to work. Foggy confronts Tower, badgering him about Fisk, invoking Mrs. Cardenas to no avail. Karen chases ghosts and manages to catch one. It seems as though, through a series of elaborate shell corporations, Fisk might own the Royal Hotel, the very place he is being held. Meanwhile, Matt infiltrates the hotel, hearing Fisk's voice in his head. In the parking garage, Matt interrogates Donovan, who spills that Vanessa is missing. Later, Foggy drowns his sorrows, only to see a ghost of his own, Matt Murdock. Matt tells him to beg off Fisk, swiping Foggy's wallet in the process. Elsewhere, Dex is sent to a routine psych eval, where he he explains he's able to cope with the job thanks to his support from Julie. Later that night, Dex sits in his car and watches Julie leave the bar and order a slice of broccoli and sausage. Just as she takes a bite inside, Dex takes a bite in his car. I think this episode is some of the more... Like, I I think from a character perspective, it's some of the show's strongest stuff that we've seen maybe since the kind of um, really big midpoint of season two when the kind of um, 
when the the biggest conflicts between Karen, Matt, and Foggy are kind of kicking off because of Electra's return and the hand and and Matt, uh, Matt and Karen's uh, you know relationship that was sort of dead and dead in the water. Uh, this is some of the best and most interesting character drama that also doesn't really like this this is what you were saying about like this doesn't hit hard i think that i completely agree with this episode there's a lot of interesting things in it and none of it made me go wow i just went yeah okay like they know what they're doing it's it's good dialogue is the thing i think um it's yeah you're right it it does embellish like a lot of character motivation i feel um and it's kind of i feel like it's going to be quite hard to not talk about it in a holistic sense as in like spoilers and stuff like that um but i i did notice that a lot of a lot of the conversations between characters like especially like between fisk and dex are planting so many seeds um for future twists and revelations and stuff like that Mm -hmm. uh but yeah, to at the moment it's um it's hard to see maybe where those are going if you don't know if you don't already know. I think that's a really good point. And I, I suppose in some sense that's why um if we think about say I mean I, I mean okay, let's like let's start at the start because there's a few things I want to touch on um that I th- I think are uh gonna be structurally important um for how we conceptualize the FBI's role in this show. Um however, my first note is Vinny D looking good in the shell. My guy is bulked. <laughs> yeah. just some vinnie d appreciation society over here mm-hmm. he's a he's mm-hmm. such a he's such a physical guy and you know he's and he's standing there and he's you know the 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 water is like washing off the the blood and the dirt from the uh from the motorcade and he just looks like he looks like he's a thousand miles away thinking about something else we just have no conception of yeah he is a titan oh, that <laughs> is exactly it yeah. And what's, you know, I mean, the, the key conflict of this episode in some sense for Fisk is that the FBI basically, you know, they hate the fact they lost all these men um, for Fisk. Um, all of these agents are killed with families for this guy. Um, and this is one of the few times where we see Fisk actually stressed about something. You know, we've said before that he has two modes, right? He has uh, uh, calm, collected um, weaving spider webs fisk and then he has animals screeching beating people's heads in fisk and this is sort of a third gear we haven't really seen before which is in this moment he doesn't have any cards to play you know he's he's not in control in this moment the second he comes out of the shower and even though his lawyers are there uh when 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 we when he learns that vanessa is missing it's this moment of like oh he he does like you know he's got no more straws to draw right he drew the short straw and now he's in it and he's gonna have to without his usual toolbox of tricks without his usual this that and the fifth thing he's gonna have to go from ground zero and and try and um build his way out of this try and develop a new toolbox to escape this scenario and and i i like the way that that is really nicely put next to uh, you know, Nadim gets in Fisk's face big time at the start, right? And he's angry because they lost his agents. But also, you know, I, I said last time that Nadim, you know, he's he's sort of the, he has the rat in the cage problem. And I like the way that Nadim kind of, Fisk has this sort of calm, uh, f- f- like, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is, but sort of a, a calm panic about him. Um, and Nadim's sort of panic is very loud and like they're, they're both caged rats, but Nadim can't see a way out of it. Whereas I think Fisk, even though he has no tools and he has no plan, you know, he's, he seems in some sense confident in himself that he has the ability to get out of this. And I like that yes. juxtaposition, like by putting those two characters next to each other and having Nadim yell at him. And that's, um, uh, that that disposition that Fisk has, it does two things. It makes him sympathetic, first of all, to to the audience, but also to other characters such as Dex. Um, and it projects. It's as if he's projecting that he has some sort of truth about him, um, which is also something that's very alluring to Dex, and is something that will become like very very crucial to uh, the relationship between them. Yeah. Yeah. In a sense, Fisk has solved reality in a way that 
for someone like Dex, Dex seems impossible. Mm. Mm-hmm. There's a, mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't know uh, where this is from. So if I, if I'm quoting someone, I d- could not tell you where from. If someone does know, please write in or, or leave a comment. Uh, you know, Dex is a guy who has figured out that he's really good at one thing. Um, he, he was probably really good in school and probably really good at his job, but he can't seem to figure out his life. And mm-hmm. for me as a character, there is, there are all these questions around, what does that mean for someone like Fisk who uh, solved, uh, you know, it's in, in some sense, like seems to have the skeleton key for every situation. Uh, what does it mean for these characters to be in proximity to each other? And what does that do to someone like Nadim who like doesn't like Nadim is screwed, right? We said that last episode, he has all this debt. Um, his like his family loves him, but they don't seem to like him, right? He's just this guy who cannot, catch a break like we've said before and yeah there's a nice sort of uh there's there's a there's a way this for me sets up some questions later some questions for Mm -hmm. fisk some questions for for dex and and perhaps most importantly uh from a structural perspective some questions for nadim right uh at what point at what point is he gonna take an action to stop his life from falling apart because this is his first real uh, ounce of responsibility this fisk detail this decision to move fisk and it breaks bad immediately and gets a bunch of agents killed right his confidence mm. is rattled here in a big in a big way and the question i think for him is can he ever claim that confidence back by himself yeah the <laughs> it's such a his whole plot for nadim is such like a des- desperate scramble <laughs> ever since the he makes that first like critical decision. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, that it's first so mistake. like, yeah, it's so compelling because he's like such. He otherwise seems like such a decent person. Um, yeah, right. He's like just put into like these impossible dilemmas. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, he he paid off um, uh, his wife's sister's cancer treatment. Right, like you mm-hmm. know, has has blown up his life in order to has basically stole his. You know, might have doomed his career. Um, mm. to save this person's life, and all he gets for it is shit from the universe. Yeah, it's it's, it's a it's an unjust universe, dead I mean, we said that in season one, but I think it's it's especially true. Um, in the in yeah. this opening, plus like you know, Vanessa. I, I don't think we should sort of walk past Vanessa being missed. Um, too much. It does get resolved relatively quickly, but I think. I think this is the moment where Fisk decides he's going to have to do something about the situation. The second he realizes Vanessa is missing, it's not just like his only reason for surviving is missing, but it's also like, you know, in some sense, especially in that previous episode where he's trapped in the car and he has no, he can't do anything about it. I think he's suddenly going, shit, I like, I need to do something here or like everything that I have is, is going to slip away. Like I'm this close to losing it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's a really excellent opening sequence. And then we, and then we get daredevil being funny again, um, which is the, the Emma, the Ellison family dinner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is great. Um, so it's Ellison, Ellison's wife. Um, and I think uh, Ellison's nephew or something like that. Um, and, uh, it's, it's quite good because, you know, we start, it's like a relatively normal dinner. Um, and then Ellison's wife lets slip that it's actually a setup. And then it's just Karen and Ellison in the kitchen bickering with each other. <laughs> and like, to be fair, <laughs> it was kind of a shitty thing to do by, by Ellison. I like how, I like the, the line that he says, well, you know, I, I knew if I'd ask you, you'd say no. And she goes, yeah, that's the part where it gets to be my choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like, yeah, you got nothing to say to that. And, when, and, then, and then he comes in over the top with like, you know, she's like, you know, I'm not ready or whatever. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out work or whatever. And he goes, right. He goes, yeah, but are you happy? And it's such like an incisive thing to say to someone like Karen where, you know, she, much like Matt, will prioritize literally everything except her own happiness. Right. Yeah. And it's him just being like, come on, what am I supposed to do? Like, this, of course I had to lie to you because you would have said no. And like, that's. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It is a great. Um, I I just love their relationship. It is. It's it's super wholesome. Yeah, just that good mentor mentee shit that you like to see. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Plus, uh, you get... Uh, I can't remember... The, do, what is the news that they get that Ellison goes out to investigate? Is it that the motorcade is attacked? I can't remember. Um, no, no. It, they, they learn that Fisk has uh, been released or, you know, is being moved. Um, and I think the, that news gets out because the, there's that motorcade attack. Oh, gotcha. Okay, right. Yeah. And 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 what, what's really great in this moment um, is that Ellison sidelines Karen, uh, which is such a f- for me like a lateral move for Ellison, where you know he just kind of he basically like looks her in the eye and just like breaks her down and goes, "Look, you're staying here. This isn't a conversation. Like this is way too personal for you." Um, like I'm doing this and I know why you want to do this and that's why you can't be involved. And then he leaves, Mm -hmm. which is great. The, um, the obsession that, uh, that Karen's face has not, not just in this moment in the episodes, uh, the moments, the following episodes. Well, it, it, it is on par with, uh, Matt. Like this is like manic obsession over, over the, over Fisk. Um, well, so same with Foggy. Interesting. Right? Sorry. Same with Foggy. He he sort of yeah. enters this a similar arena. Less less frenetic, yeah. but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're all very obsessive, <laughs> obsessive. Wait, and that's actually something I also want to uh, talk about a bit later. Is is Misk, Fisk's role is kind of like larger than life for this season. Like he almost takes on a bit of a mythical role. I don't know if that's... Well, yeah, I mean, there is a literal thing yeah. that happens, which is, like, a- outside of reality, um, which yeah, is yeah. actually the, the next kind of sequence. So, independently, and this is where I just think, like, the show rules, independently, Matt and Karen both turn up at the hotel, uh, and Karen uh, goes and interviews Nadim, and he basically tells her to fuck off, more or less. Um, and Matt decides... Uh, Matt's standing in the kind of courtyard outside where all the protesters are, and he, he hears... Fisk in his head, uh, sort of the the devil on the shoulder type thing, and yeah. you know the, the exchange is interesting to me, where Fisk is sort of goading Matt. Um, how do you feel about the like at a dramatic level, the choice to have Fisk on screen here and like clearly in Matt's head? Um, I, I guess like I have questions about it from a genre perspective, and I have questions about it from a yeah. What are we supposed to take is actually like? What are we supposed to take is actually happening here? Like, is Matt actually hearing Fisk's voice in his head, or is this sort of a way to to demonstrate his internal monologue or something? Right, the latter. It's like a sim- symbolic dramatization of Matt's conscience, um, which is yeah. To to your point, it is sort of a bit of a left turn in terms of genre. Um, it's something that you wouldn't expect from this show but um i i dig it i think it's you're already going pretty hard in the religious slash mythical themes this season i think this is kind of a cool little element to add to that right i i, mm. I want to elaborate a little bit on like why this is such a left-hand turn because i, I was thinking about it and i couldn't put my finger on it till you just said what you said which is it's that the the show is deeply concerned with the interior psychology of all of these characters and the drama that that produces. And this is a on-screen literal representation of someone's internal psychology, which is something we've never seen before. We have to usually read that between cues or through actions or through what's not said. Um, And this is the first time we've really had someone step into frame and go, this is what this character is thinking. Now, it's important that we get this confirmation because it is the central struggle of the season, the central question that Matt faces. But it is a different way of showing this. You know, you could imagine another scenario. And here's the problem. Here's, here's why I think this happens. I think they've written themselves into a corner because he can't go back home to the church and talk to Sister Maggie and say, hey, I'm thinking about going going out there and killing Fisk. That's a non-starter conversation. He's already had yeah. this conversation with Father Lantern a dozen times in season one. So that's a double beat. He can't go to Foggy because Foggy thinks he's dead. He can't go to Karen because Karen thinks he's dead and also 
you know, there's still something between them there that is unresolved. Like he has no one to go to, to talk about this. And so the show without a card to play has him talk to himself, I guess, which is Mm -hmm. like an interesting dramatic choice. I like, I I dig, I, again, I'm with you. I think it's cool. Um, I am given to wonder if there isn't a, a different decision here that could have been more compelling. I'm not sure what that decision would be. Yeah. I, I can't really think of anything else either, but, um, I think uh, a result of, of of this decision is maybe it adds to Matt's delusion a bit. Like, you know, he's he's meant to be a bit off his rocker this season. And I guess, you know, it's always it's not always so easy to identify that if you're from the perspective of the of the protagonist who's having these conversations with imaginary people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can see but, that. But yeah. I think it would have been funny if, um, if like you were from the perspective of someone else from for a minute and just hearing Matt talk to himself, and that would like really emphasize how off his rocker he is. Yeah, that would really put it put it up there. Oh, yeah. oh, it just occurred to me. And Electra's dead, and Stick is dead. So like he really just doesn't. There's just no one. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, and, and you know, it's not just that he's delusional, right? Like, I think. When people are delusional, they're they're dangerous, right? <laughs> um, right. And this 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 is a pretty intense conflict that um, that is being set up here between Matt and Fisk. It's not it's not the superhero. I'm going to take him down. It's Matt contemplating whether he's going to kill him or not, which is pretty heavy stuff. Um, right. Right. And and. Uh, the conversations between Matt and and imaginary Fisk are a lot of them is Fisk taunting him. Um, you know, he says stuff like, "Wouldn't it be funny if I ended up saving more people in this city than you ever did?" It's the personal, vindictive stuff that is going on between these two in his head. Um, yeah, it's quite it's quite dark if you if you think about it like that. I guess. Yeah, well, and he brings up yeah. the fact that Matt tried to kill himself. You know, yeah, yeah and he yeah. sort of he sort of goes, "Oh, do you think that like God let me out to punish you for trying to kill yourself? Don't think I didn't notice, you know." Mm. Um, and it's such a great, you know, uh, it's such a great illustration of the way that like Matt's guilt just is like twisting him into these knots that just seem impossible to undo. Mm. And then, I mean, while this is happening, um. <laughs> Karen, Karen bails up Nadima, basically just yells at him, doesn't really ask him any proper questions, just kind of yells at him for a minute. Um, and this is one of those few times where I'm like, these guys have really interesting, like, on-screen chemistry. I would have liked to see them maybe interact more, and I hope the season might have them converse more, because I think they would have, like, an interesting conversation to have, especially Nadim, this, like, fraught guarded dude who just has nothing left and karen feeling like she has nothing left that could be kind of interesting yeah well i even think that this little conversation is pretty interesting because it, they're both they both make really good points um i like how karen says you know deem says he, he has not been released that's fake news um he's uh he's just been moved and then karen says oh well, what's he having for dinner the filet mignon or whatever um and then you know nadim retorts back oh well you know you should He's going to save lives. You write about the, the five cops that got killed moving him. And, like, you know, there's, there's no right answer between those two, uh, those two arguments. And this, yeah, there's a lot of that stuff in these. Plus, episodes. like, it's plus the FBI are fucking with Fisk's food. Like, Dex and his friend are messing yeah, with Fisk's yeah. food constantly. So it's, it's also just an interesting thought there. Um, mm. I also want to put a pin in the idea of, I, I want to say it now because I want to come back to it in the next episode. I want to pop a pin and put it up on the, on the, uh, the, the board. Um, the question of the timing of this season being written and its conception of policing, um, because mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot to kind of dig into in the next episode with a particular scene um, that, that I think we can pull a lot out of. Um, and just keeping in mind for anyone uh, who is sort of unaware, this this season came out in 2018 in October, and sort of was written in the preceding year and change. 
Um, so this is peak, um, this is peak, like the world is going to go one way or the other, one way or the other, um, uh, with, with the election. Um, and we obviously went the dark timeline, uh, where, where Trump gets elected. Um, but this is that moment just before everything is on the knife's edge and before literally the conception of a lot of the core building blocks of what this show, of what this season specifically is about, um, will change forever in the contemporary understanding of, um, of how the world works. Um, so that's just worth putting a pin in. We'll come back to it in the next episode because there's a scene that I think would never make it into a show now. Um, we'll talk about when we, when we get to it. Pat okay. doesn't know what I'm talking about, but we'll get there. I don't. Um, there you go. That's a little sizzle, Pat. You gotta, you gotta cool. keep listening to find out what that scene is. You know. <laughs> gotta uh, keep him in the dark. Keep him, keep him keen. You could treat, <laughs> treat him. <laughs> Treat him without light, keep him keen. <laughs> um, also, Matt then does a hitman level to get into the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> this is, I love this sequence because it's so unique um, of Matt trying to act like a seeing person. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all these little nuances that he does in, in trying to act like he isn't blind. And he gets, he gets the, I, the, pin, the pin, he gets the pin wrong the first time when he's trying to do the gate. Um, he has yeah, to yeah. he has to breeze past the guy and just pick the first. The guy's like, "Hey, hand me or whatever," and he just gives him something. And he, he's he's like trying to like nod to everyone as well, um, just like uh, like he acknowledges them or whatever. And like, I, I'm I'm always thinking as well, like how hard this must be for Charlie Cox to keep your eyes sort of like you know kind of more or less locked in one place uh, as you're moving about. There's conversations later where he's looking someone in the face and he's somehow not making eye contact. Yeah, it's so impressive. That must, yeah, that must be so hard. Yeah. He's, he is honestly the real, like, he's doing a lot of work here to, to make, like, we've, we've said this about other characters, and particularly the Punisher, um, when it comes to physicality. This is one of the first times we've seen Matt kind of use the fact that he just looks like a normal dude quite effectively yeah. you know like in in the he, he certainly doesn't have like a barcode on the back of his head but he is a guy who could fit in kind of anywhere right mm. yes with the notable exception that he's blind which is like the cool fly in the ointment but once he gets inside um he's sort of assessing what's happening and he's sort of overhearing the fbi and this and the third thing i mean fisk kind of you know devil on the shoulder goes okay well you're inside now what and you know we then cut to just again some like top tier Vinny D'Onofrio acting where Fisk is contemplating everything that's happening with Vanessa being missing with the situation he's in um he's trying to think of a way to start making some changes and he's staring at the wall and he all it, this it's just incredible he almost twitches and doesn't <laughs> He like starts to, and then he sort of like slowly corrects himself. Yeah, it's you know, like, it's, how the hell do you even do that? I don't understand how this man is as good as he is. Um, <laughs> and and you know, it's it, it's this question of like he's forcing himself to stay composed, um, to fight the panic, um, so that he can mm. f- focus on these these machinations he needs to put into place. You know, he's he's desperately trying to find that first move to play to start the ball rolling. Um, and he just doesn't have one yet. And it's this kind mm. of like quiet, tense panic. And he just kills it. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. And you have to imagine in the script, all it says is like, Fisk stares at the wall in his bedroom or whatever. Um, or Fisk, Fisk sits in a chair in the middle of the room and stares at the wall. Um, mm. you know, and then he just puts so much into it. And, and they, they, they brilliantly call attention to it by having the FBI guys like Dex and his boys be like, what is he doing? He's so weird. <laughs> yeah, actually, that 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 didn't occur to me. That is a good um, rhythm to that beat to have like a joke immediately after it. Yeah, yeah. and to have it be yeah. Dex, no less. They're doing so yeah. much work with Dex. Um, it's he's such an interesting character to to watch. You know, mm. what I, I was trying to think about this. Um, last night what energy do you think dex has because to me like he's not blood psychopath by any means but he's got like a weird aggressive boy scout vibe or something like i don't know how to peg him he's yet. got a kind of like 
don't know, he's got a kind of dog energy to him. I don't know okay. if that's mean, but like, uh, he's he he seems to, I, I you know, probably why. Actually, I won't say that. He he needs some direction. He needs someone. He needs a he needs someone to shepherd him to point him in the right direction. Kind of. That's the energy I get. He's got. He's uh. He is too turbulent to be uh on his own to to essentially have freedom to do what he likes and to make decisions. Know, right? Yeah, yeah. He doesn't know what to do with that. There's a um in the British Secret Service they call agents like that who kind of you know rise to a certain rank and are really really good at field work specifically and will never be able to move up to supervisor because of that reason they literally call them dogs. Yeah, they're like yeah we'll send the is dogs this, after them. Yeah, is this from your Slow Horses show? Yeah, yeah. It's it's apparently a yeah. real thing they used to say in the eighties. So there you go. Nice bit of bit of a uh, MI six trivia for you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, um yeah look uh, and and then we get uh then we get foggy going to tower and having a go you know re- just really tr- put, trying to put the screws to him as best foggy can Actually, ju- sorry yeah you what do you got what, what, one last thing about the um uh that that scene with fisk his yeah. lawyers come and you know they uh oh actually is that is this the bit where they tell they say that they found uh vanessa and she was in spain is that now or is that later? Oh, it might be later. Oh, no, no. No, no, that, that is now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I read it before the tower scene. So they, they said, um, you know, we found her. She, we, hit, we hit her in Spain. And then he, uh, this goes, you hit her in Spain? And then, uh, you know, he's, he's furious. The, 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 uh, the monster is about to come out. And then Donovan goes, yeah, well, you know, she, she likes the art. And Miss Mariano can be very insistent. And then. It's funny how that line just like instantly like calms him down. Like he understands exactly, <laughs> exactly how that probably <laughs> went. He goes, "Yes, yes, she can." Um, also, Donovan's it's... like knack for survival here, right? Is you know, <laughs> yeah. he, he has a really good read on Fisk. Yes, um, I just like that bit. That's all I wanted. To no, say. It's it's a good little scene. <laughs> Plus, I th- if you think about the way this is sequenced, um, uh, you know, if if we go back to like film 101 right the cooler shove effect you, you have a you have a shot where fisk is staring at the wall thinking about how to solve the problem in front of him which is i have no tools to play vanessa is missing this situation that i had planned has immediately fallen apart uh you know whatever whatever goal he had in mind of being moved here hasn't like did not include the fbi getting killed which has obviously soured the relationship he was hoping to build there then mm. we get the shot of the fbi watching him being like what is he up to then we get Donovan um, and the other lawyer coming in and being like, she's in Spain. And they have the little exchange. And it's like that, as he's building up to that, and then Donovan says, you know, she could be really insistent. It's like a pressure release valve from these two, these mm. two shots preceding it, right? It's like a, a silent panic building up, observation of silent panic. News comes in that's bad, builds, 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 pressure release. And what it feels like is when Donovan says this, Fisk goes, okay, that's one less piece on the board I have to worry about. I can now focus on doing, doing the other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, um, it's like in, uh, if you imagine the way that Fisk thinks about reality, it's like a game of chess. It's like he was in check for like way too long, um, like four or five moves in a row, and finally he's out of it. And you can now focus on going on the offensive again and maybe her um her resolve in you know getting her way maybe that's maybe it inspired fisk in that moment maybe that's why you know he loves her that much yeah damn damn pat some people just (laughs) meant for each other like that huh (laughs) (laughs) when you're titan of crime and you're a art connoisseur are soulmates (laughs) yeah it's a tale as old as time, Pat. <laughs> oh, it's a match made in hell. I'll tell you what. <laughs> it is, literally. Because uh, it's Hell's Kitchen. That's, that's one for all you pun, all you dads out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, really, really great scene. I'm glad that you brought that up because I like, I like the reading there that, um, yeah, that, that her resolve to still do the thing 
right? To still have the passion is, is maybe something that ignites some f- further drive within him. Yes. Because I also, I also don't know that Fisk, I, it's interesting you use the word inspired because I, I think, I don't know that Fisk is a person who can be inspired so much as like driven, if you know what I mean. Right, he doesn't. He 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 doesn't seem like he would sort of. There's there's no awe to to him in, in these moments. It's like it's like a primal. It's like a sort of primal need. Um, it's it's recognizing someone else still has it and doubling down on on that kind of fire within him. Yeah, yeah. Like it. I, also, like he doesn't. Is he doesn't change course or anything? It's not something he wasn't already going to do. It's just some. Yeah, he just needed a bit of motivation bit of drive yeah yeah it's more gas in the tank rather than like a revelation to change the destination yes yeah yeah uh okay yeah so the next scene then uh we get foggy going to tower doing a big speech at him like only foggy can i <laughs> they fix it in the next episode but they keep directing him like this and it's just i don't know why i've said this before i just think they need to bring foggy down like two or three degrees on his delivery in these speeches. Somehow they get it right in the next episode, but this just, it's very weird. It feels like Foggy doing a speech to a person who's not in the room. Actually, that's, you raise a good point there, comparing uh, his sequence in the next episode. Um, yeah, that he is, is very over the top in this scene. But I don't know, I've just come to associate that with Foggy at this point, you know? Yeah. I mean, my most yeah. generous read is... Because he has absolutely no control over the situation he's in. He's just, he's like full, just over the top, trying to just get as much of that frustration out as he can. And the next episode, Mm. the second that Marcy gives him a plan, he's like, okay, now it's time to rock and roll. Like this is, and that's the Foggy Nelson that we know and love, which is like, now that he's found a gear that he can shift into, he's going full speed. Yeah. Yeah, and and he and, and this is the funny thing about Foggy is he doesn't like he's first or sec, first and second gear make him uncomfortable. Second, he's in third, like he's just he's good to go. And then he's and then the mm-hmm. second he's running at full speed, he's a lot calmer because that's when he operates the best. You know. Yes. We saw that in yeah, Frank Castle's trial as well. Mm. A lot of car analogies for me today. Not sure what that's <laughs> what that's about. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't been thinking about cars. I haven't like been watching any racing. That's just sort of happened to me. I don't know what to make mm. of that. That's it's maybe how all car people start out. They just wake up one day, a changed person. Oh, you think this is how it begins? Yeah, maybe, possibly. I'm, I'm going to come back in two weeks and I've started watching F1 or something. Yeah, you have a project car in your garage. Oh, no. Fix it up. Yeah. Yeah. I suddenly have opinions about Hamilton and Ferrari. That'll mean something to F1 people. <laughs> um, okay, so... It was quite historic, Pat. Hamilton is moving to Ferrari, and everyone's in a ruckus about it for some reason. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's right. You heard it here yeah. first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, look, I don't have a lot to say there other than I, I wanted to, <laughs> without specifically planning the car analogy part of that, I did just want to, like, I guess, try and hone in on what they're trying to do with Foggy's character there. Um, which, yeah, it's, it's uh, like he's not, you know, not, not good idling. Well, I think this scene is interesting because um, it's an it's it, it's an example of kind of subtle corruption. I think, um, mm-hmm. you know, he's 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 kind of softly lying slash twisting the truth about trying to fight the Fisk move, right? Because we know, don't we know that that's bullshit? Like he we we saw the scene. he was there in the meeting. Yeah. Hey. We we yeah we were in the meeting with Nadim, yeah. his supervisor, the head of police, and it wasn't. It wasn't Tower that pushed back. It was the head of police. Uh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, and the implication being that Tower is um, happy to sort of turn a blind eye to that issue because it's going to get him election points. Um, right. Which is what Foggy points out in the next episode, right? Which is that classic quote, which is like, you know, all it takes for evil to succeed is for good men to do nothing. And Blake Tower is right. a good man doing nothing. And, you know, this season is very enthusiastic about um, how corruption uh, occurs in institutions and, you know, uh, sort of peace institutions. Mm. Um, yeah. Perhaps inadvertently predicting the next three years. 
um, <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to law enforcement. I guess I, I, I wanted to ask you about this because, you know, we talked a lot about in this show about some of the the iconography and the maneuvers this this show borrows from Batman and, that, and its mythos. And I need to issue a correction, which is someone Ooh. wrote in, uh, and I don't have the email in front of me. Someone wrote in and was like, well, like, technically Daredevil didn't start as a joke reaction to Batman. It became that as it went on. So apparently it didn't start that way, but after about five years, that's what it evolved into, which is what I was clearly remembering incorrectly. So I just want to issue a correction uh, that it didn't start that way. It was its own thing. Uh, and then it became that as it went on. So uh, that's my official I'll eat my hat uh, moment. <laughs> See, I, I would have thought it was, it'd be the other way around. Yeah. That's how things normally go, I feel, yeah. Usually. I mean, it, and then it, be, you know, obviously it became its own thing at a certain point. Um, but uh, yeah, those comics got real weird, man. There was one point where everyone knew that Matt Murdock was Daredevil and he'd t- turn up to court wearing like a full red like dress suit that's kind of that's kind of cool it's a look let me tell you <laughs> yeah it was a vibe there was one arc where uh what well, it, it was like he and electra got married and then she she didn't die but something happened and she ended up in an alternate reality or something there was the 90s were a weird time for everybody in comic books <laughs> I think I think until Gaiman stepped until Gaiman stepped in, uh, no one really knew what the direction of comics was going to be. I don't think. Um, mm-hmm. All of that being said, uh, I think the, the this season's question is the Batman Joker question, right? Which is, does if if Matt refuses to kill Fisk, does that mean he's accountable for everything Fisk has done and will do wrong? Does that make him, uh, you know, are they are those deaths on Matt? Um, and, and, and how does he react to that? And will he damn himself, uh, in order to, to save the city and to save those lives, right? That's the line that you talked about before, you know, wouldn't it be funny if I saved more lives in Hell's Kitchen than you ever did, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Prompting that question of, which, which is great because it's this question about saving lives and Matt's considering taking a life. It's that Mm -hmm. nice, um, inverse force that's being you know, pressure, pressured and, and put upon Matt uh, that he's putting upon himself in some way. And what's most interesting in this moment, in this season, is that it seemingly has nothing to do with his religion like it did in the first season. You know, if, if he doesn't believe in God anymore, then, or he, he doesn't, he's not on God's side, then what fear is there to be had f- for killing Fisk, right? Does he actually not believe anymore or is there still some dormant, part of him in his reptile brain that that is afraid of that damnation and you get a pretty clear answer to me in some sense which is uh i don't know who says it but it, it's it's a scene with matt in it i believe um basically that like now that fisk is out um you know it, it's like being in hell um and he's and matt's mm. the devil right um and so yeah it's, it's that question of like will if, if he's already damned damned if he does damned if he doesn't will he just do it you should be rotting in a cell. So you're going to bring me back to prison. But you know that won't work. It's only one way to stop me, but you're not going to do it. Are you sure about that? In a way, you're my accomplice. Everything that's happened since you refused to kill me is on you. The bodies that I've stacked up. The ones to come. I wonder who's next. You have the rowdy number. Two million in euros. No, today, my client is not a patient man. You can follow him right to me. You know you want to. I see your room key, sir? Yeah, I got it. No, I need to see it. Oh, sure. You can take him, grab his gun. Come for me. I'm caged up, unarmed. Sir, they gave me like three of them. Uh... But you won't. You can't kill me. You can't even kill yourself. Yeah, you know what? I must have left it in my car. Then I can't let you through. Sure, I, uh, I'll, I'll be right back.
I think his attitude towards um, religious consequences to killing Fisk, I think he still is quite convinced that um, that those two are linked. That you know, if if he does take a life, he is going against uh, God, and you know he will. And but he's willing to accept the punishments that come along with that. Right. Um, okay. So I think what what the interesting thing that's going on here is that first of all he you know he he's um okay with that you know supposedly he's he's okay with being damned um because he as he says he's already damned so you know he might as well do this act which will maybe produce a lot of good um uh and so and so if he's okay with being damned the question then becomes well why does he still hesitate and I, f- and I feel like it's this interesting tension between um, his, uh, his faith and something, something else, something more human, something more kind of secular but also spiritual about what, if, if uh, religious damnation isn't the consequence, then why doesn't he, why is he still having d- d- uh, doubts about taking a life? Um, yeah. Which I think ricochets off the fact that he learns that the reason Fisk has done all of this is because Vanessa mm. is is mm. potentially in danger, right? Um, and if if we think about the way that Matt talked about thinking of himself as Job, um, you can put that as as a lot of um, theologians do. You can put Job in conversation with uh, the Good Samaritan, right? Which is the uh, the parable that Fisk ev- evokes in at the end of season one. Um, where Fisk says, you know, I, I thought I was, I thought I was the good Samaritan, but, but I, I am the ill intent. intent who set upon the traveler on a road that he should not have been on, you know, beset upon the traveler. And Matt thought he was Job, which is this guy who takes all of this punishment, right? He takes all this punishment and doesn't complain. And instead, you know, he seems to have a similar realization to Fisk, which is like, no, I'm not, I'm not the good guy here. Um, because the good guy here is the sucker. I need to be more than that. And being more than that means being willing to transgress, right? If, if Foggy mm. says, um, you, you know, if, if good men do nothing, that's, that's what, what allows evil to thrive. I think for a character like Matt here, it's how far, how far can I go before I come the very thing that I'm trying to stop? And I don't know mm. that we get a clear answer if that is the reason that he is struggling with it. And, you know, I, I, I want to settle this up because it's what the season's about, right? Um, but I think, you know, that, that question of, like, um, you, you know, if, if, you, if you... What's the quote? It's like if you, you know, it's spend too much time fighting monsters, you know, you might you, you be wary unless you become one. That's the mm. Batman Joker question. I think this is more layered and textured than that in some ways because it's also... It feels to me that if Matt does this, that is like, like Matt Murdock is over forever. I know we keep saying it's done, but it's, it doesn't feel definitive until that line is crossed. It feels like he has a path back until he, until he crosses that line. Yeah. I think another, I mean, I I suppose Batman does explore this as well a little bit, but I think another element that distinguishes this a bit from batman is that um we spend so much time with fisk as well um and it's not just about what happens to matt's soul if he takes a life it's that well uh, fisk is a person what happens if he dies he has someone he loves and someone that loves him and that becomes a very sort of interesting question as the season progresses yeah yeah he is a he is a person in a way that like yeah. the joker is often not permitted to be mm. you know mm. yeah i think that's actually a re- you've yeah you've you've really keyed into something that it is is the difference between i, I suppose what this is looking to do and, and perhaps yeah the contemporaries that are thinking about the same thing and this this is tricky right I, i've talked about this before with uh with novels in particular um and i've and i've, I've blown a lot of uh whatever the opposite of smoke is at the Skullduggery Pleasant series, because one of my biggest gripes with those books is, uh, you know, while very fun and, and really well written, and they have really dynamic characters, they each book will have, you know, pretty long and extensive sequences from the bad guy's perspective 
that is used to like shortcut a lot of development that would have to be done carefully without that point of view. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I, I think perhaps in contrast to something like Gaiman's Neverwhere, um, it, you know, in that story, you, you follow uh, Krupp and, and, and Vandemar uh, from their perspective, but it's like, but it's to develop the payoff and those characters as sort of more than just caricatures of villains. Whereas I, I think definitely in, in the early ones from the Skullduggery Pleasant series, it is literally used to be like, this is the stereotype of this villain and this is their plan. And it forces uh, less difficult choices from a writing perspective. And I think right, they've, right. this story has taken the similar approach, but like gone for, they, like they want the whole meal, right? They want to go, okay, we're not just going to have Fisk's perspective. We are going to make this so fully fleshed out that it embellishes and complicates the questions and themes of the season and, and, and these questions of uh, justice and morality that the show has always been about. They sort of do both and take them to, the, to their natural extremity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's great. I have actually... The, the show is almost taking like a maximalist approach to morality (laughs) it's kind of funny in that way yeah yeah and ironically like it ends up being it still ends up being quite subtle at times in this season Mm. and at other times maybe not so much not to foreshadow too much of what's to come but um i can't wait to forget that because i have so much to say about it but there is like the extended flashbacks we get and the ways that it tries to work that into conversation with some of this stuff is a, is a, such a choice um, that I, mm. I definitely wouldn't have made. But look, let's let's put a pin in it. I'm sure we're gonna have a lot to say about this as the show goes on. <laughs> because yeah, I mean that that obviously the show is about morality, like right, like. But yeah, this this maximalist approach might have some might backfire, and at certain <laughs> points is is how I feel. <laughs> yeah. Again, not remembering specifics. I'm interested to see if I feel that way when we get there. The isn't it interesting that this so this was 2018, so it's interesting to think about everything that happened since then and how that's completely changed my worldview and I think a lot of people's worldview um, and the way that we sort of conceive of <laughs> stuff we should be prioritizing. So I'm I'm curious if all of that and like being a you know obviously the foundations of me are the same, but you know have, having a lot of kind of different things that have changed me since then i'm interested to see how those things land i might turn around and be like this is the best choice the show's ever made so i'm I'm, I'm pretty curious to to get there mm, okay the next scene we get is nadim and hadley uh, at the hospital and it's really grim like everyone is just like complete it's just it's really dark um mm. and nadim kind of you know goes up to hadley's his boss and, and they're sort of talking quietly um, and sh- she goes, look, you know, no one blames you. And Nadim goes, I blame me, which is a really great exchange. Um, again, that dynamic they have continues to evolve and be interesting. Mm. And it, yeah, I have so many questions. There are these moments where it's like, there's a weird intimacy they have that I can't put my finger on. And it's moments like this that, like, I go, what is, what is this? What is their relationship before, like, they came on screen? Yeah, that's yeah. It's a good point, actually. I don't know. They both, they both have kids, I suppose. Maybe. Yeah, that's that's how it goes with people in the workplace. You know, if you have, <laughs> there's like someone <laughs> who has kids, and you have kids. It's like it's, it's all the first point of conversation always when you see them. Yeah, that's our connective yeah. tissue. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then of course we have, we have the Fisk Dex scene where. Uh, Fisk is uh, desk. Dex drops off Fisk's uh, food, um, and they—it's uh, a really interesting detail. Where every time they deliver him food, they put it in this like little wooden tray thing that looks like it's for a bento box or something. I don't know what is going on mm-hmm. with that thing, <laughs> or, or what this choice is. Is it they don't want him to have metal? Like I, I just don't—I don't know what why they are doing this. <laughs> Yeah, I because they keep like trying to like humiliate him and like sort of degrade him. Um, so maybe that's an one element of it. Um, but yeah, also you know they take away all the 
the ceramic plate and stuff like that you know potential weapons and they you know they they strip they i don't know if they strip search him but they search his bedroom in the next episode so mm-hmm. probably just safety stuff yeah yeah he has to eat everything with a little cardboard spork yeah it's brutal um <laughs> Yeah, and then Fisk goes, um, this is as Fisk is dropping the food off. Fisk says, it's Special Agent Point Dexter, isn't it? You saved my life last night. And Dex immediately claps back with, we all make mistakes, which is mm. very good character work. And also just funny <laughs> to be like, yeah, <laughs> we all make mistakes, man. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. It's great. And it, it's, it's so interesting watching um, D'Onofrio's performance here. Uh, because it's, I, I think the you know the, the subtext of the scene is that um, he notices that Dex is you know, essentially putting on an act. You know, he's um, uh, there is something tr- uh, being forced with how, what Dex is saying and how he's acting, and, and that's why I, what I was saying before about how uh, Fisk projects this kind of ethereal truth about him, and that and. Uh, you know, at this point in time, you can see how, um, uh, you can see the seeds being set up for um, a, a possible t- uh, arc, possible revelation in Dex's story. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 way that his injustice or distaste is somehow performative, and that Fisk is like sort of. Yeah, able yeah. to perceive that, I think, is yeah. It's, it seems yeah, like it's something like, no one else sees, right? He has this villainous knack for for picking out the troubled people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then Dex goes to the psyche valve finally, which he's been putting off for a little bit, and has now. I had forgotten where this was going, so as this is happening, I was like, "Oh, did Dex have a?" partner i didn't know about the whole time okay maybe i forgot that because they have a super normal exchange where the doctor's like hey you know just forget the psych shit just talk to me like you know how are you doing he's like yeah you know like it's a tough job but you know i i uh, you know i'm able to talk to julia like and and she listens and she supports me and i just you know it's i have that stability and and he sort of rattles off some things they do together and one of them is i think he says like tuesday nights you know it's it's pizza night you know, she always get, we always get broccoli and sausage, you know, whatever it is, gives the specific details. And I, I noticed the specificity and went, huh, I wonder if that's going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Spoils, it goes somewhere. Yeah. He's such an interesting dude. I, I'd forgotten how layered Dex is. It, I kind of think that, um, you, when you create characters like Dex who are mentally unstable, you have to you have to make these sort of hard line choices about about making details about their lives and stuff like that. So, and uh, I can see how this kind of seems a bit random, but um, I think it's sort of just sinister enough, but also like kind of. Uh, at this point, not ostensibly evil enough to warrant, uh, you know, a judgment about him. Um, so I kind of think it's like a perfect middle of the road sort of detail to add, um, and, and and it's presented in such an in- interesting way about him explaining all these, giving these precise details in the psyche valve, and then watching what act, what he actually does. Yeah, I think part of what takes the edge off is that it's so mundane, right? That there's a mundanity yeah, yeah. here, and like, and and it's about the it's about the ritual of it, and like the consistency, mm. and yeah, you know, you, you were saying before that like he's a guy who maybe can't doesn't shouldn't be in charge, shouldn't make his own decisions. Well, certainly a ritual replicating someone else's decisions would give him comfort because it's like one less thing to have to worry about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. Also, I mean, we've already said it in the summary, but basically, I, I guess we'll talk about it now. Um. So. He, yeah, he, he basically says to the doctor, you know, Tuesday nights is pizza night. She's a bartender. So, you know, I pick her up from the bar and we go and get pizza. And it's really, really well framed where Dex pulls up to the bar. Um, the, the, the woman, presumably Julia, um, closes the bar and is walking toward 
the car and then turns left and keeps going. You think she's going to get in the car and she doesn't. And then she mm. walks into the pizza place and you know, she's chatting or whatever. Doc's, uh, Dex brings out his like tactical um, uh, little scope thing that, that he's looking through. Um, and, and, and it's the, it's a very creepy thing that they underplay really well, which is as she is eating her pizza, he brings up and he's eating the same thing. It's yeah. like, it's so weird. And like, yeah, I, I, I love how just oddly discomforting that is. It like, it's somehow, it's somehow more off putting, but less creepy than if he was just watching her. I mm. can't explain why. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, it's because he gives off the impression that he wants sort of affection and, like, you know, I guess love more or less. And, yeah, as I said, like, he's... I, I don't want to keep calling him a dog, but, <laughs> yeah, he, he's like a little puppy. He, he Put wants, some he just respect wants to be loved. on my boy. Cat calling <laughs> him a dog all episode. Um. But you know, because he's he's uh, he's unshepherded, he's unstable, he's he right. needs a, d- a direction, you know. He, but and uh, you know, there's like there's a there's a kind of it's almost like a sweet core, like you know the 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 sentiment is is a bit it's a bit sentimental, um, right? And it's like it has a kind of this lost someone who's just lost kind of vibe yeah but not that's, necessarily evil yeah that's a really you've you've hit the nail on the head yeah it's it's that it makes him feel more adrift than it does make him feel yeah evil or or malicious or something yeah i, I also think it's you know there's something about dex that's meticulous and that's really underscored by like this is a routine that he's done before and he's prepared right he knows what time she's finishing he's gone and got the pizza already like it also just speaks to that level of capability mm-hmm. you know that's more planning than i could do for anything in my life like let's be <laughs> real you know what i mean like it's this guy's on it this guy's on it if i were to stalk a woman here's how i'd do it I'm if kidding. i were to stalk <laughs> a woman it would not have this much planning patrick let me tell you that much um i would get caught immediately also i'm not <laughs> stealthy i've said this before but like I, you know like in in like a horror film or whatever um when you need to try and get away and you have to be like real quiet and you, mm. you, you sneak in through the dark house or whatever. I'm going like, I'm like, like you're hearing my feet. You hear my, my hoofers <laughs> immediately. <laughs> running into drawers left and right. Yeah, I'm knocking pants Subbing over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the first one to go. As I'm always, I'm always impressed in like The Walking Dead when they, they go and do like a big time stealth sequence. And it's like, it was a really great one in season 11 where like, uh, I think it's how they opened the season actually, or it could be season 10, I don't remember, where it's, um, they need to go into a building to get something and they, they kind of spelunk in through the skylight and the building is full of zombies, but it's like dead silent. And there's like six people and they, it's, it's like, it's Daryl and, and uh, Maggie and a bunch of other people. And they do this like military level, silent tactical strike. And at the last second, it seems like something's going to drop. And then I think uh, uh, Daryl catches it or something like that. Um, and it's like really impressive. And like I was I look at that stuff and I'm like, yeah, I would not survive the apocalypse. Like that ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm I'm standing outside, like in the car. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I can like hold the flashlight for you if you need. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But like no I don't want any more responsibility than that. That's my like <laughs> absolute that's I can't handle anymore. I feel that. Yeah. Look, I mean <laughs> to to segue us back on track. Uh, Matt, like we said before, Matt uh, Matt's doing his big time infiltration, and he goes off to Donovan uh, in the car park, uh, and does again a little stealth hitman sequence where he gets you know he, he's sort of doing all kinds of little um, you know maneuvers to take these guys out, and uh, and there's a really great moment just before so he, he gets the information from Donovan. It's like the last guy, and Fisk sort of over his shoulder is like go on let the devil out. And then Matt just like beats the shit out of this FBI agent. This is like feels good, doesn't it? Because he doesn't want to stay down. He he, he he's like Matt in that sense. He keeps yeah. trying to get up and trying to well, win yeah. the fight. And Matt says to him, <laughs> "Stay then, down, man." You yeah. Know? Can we uh, also dialogue wise? Can we talk about how great like 
Matt Murdock is the perfect millennial. The speech that they have, like, the way that they craft his dialogue, the fact that he says, stay down, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so unnecessary, but it's, like, it's it's so, it's him talking, to, it's him trying to, it's, it's like an instinct to be friendly that it, while he's beating a dude up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really I, a choice. I, I have always taken notice of that, too, yeah. I appreciate it. Stay down, man. That's it. Let the devil out. Smelled good, didn't it? Too bad you still can't get at me. Not with the FBI protecting me. I'm going to kill everyone you love. And there's nothing you can do about it. Karen does some uh, financial uh, jujitsu and figures out that the Royal Hotel, or sorry, the Presidential Hotel, is it the, I can't remember, it's Presidential or Royal, I keep getting them back to front. Yeah, I don't know yet. I don't remember. Uh, I'm sure it'll come up again. But, uh, but the hotel that Fisk is staying at are all, the, so the, she finds a connection between Fisk and all these shell companies that own the hotel, and that's that they're represented by Fisk's lawyers, so by Donovan. Proof once again that Karen was born to be a journalist, I think. Yeah. It's such a great, like, reveal to me that she just, mm. like, that she's this good at a thing she's been doing for, like, a couple months. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, she, in a way, she should be, you know, thanking Fisk for she found a raison d'etre, you know, like. Yeah, found a calling. Yeah. It's also a cool little exchange between between her and Allison where he's like, I can't put your name on this. Like, you're so biased. Mm. And she's like, I don't even want the byline. Like, I'm just trying to stop this guy. And that's where, as as he storms out, Allison's like, it, he's like, it took Ben years to be this much of a pain <laughs> in my ass. Yeah, it's a good yeah. one. Good line. Great, great characters. Love to see them together. Uh, we've already talked about it. And I mean, the next sequence is Dex stalking Julia. Um, which, which yeah, we've we've covered, and then we get the foggy Matt reunion, which is is mm-hmm. where the episode kind of crescendos. Um, do you have anything before that, um, or should we talk about the uh, the little foggy Matt exchange? The well, uh, after the car park scene, he, he goes back to the church. There's a little scene with Sister Maggie, and you know he says, "Oh, Fisk claiming to have changed over a woman," and then she says. And he says, I'm not buying it. And she says, oh, you're talking to a nun, kiddo. Love and redemption are pretty much our sales pitch. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great line. <laughs> She's such a great character, hey? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good. And also, like, just, I like that they are keep, I kind of wish she was in the next episode more. I don't know. I just, I like, I like her point of view. I think she's really compelling. Yes. So, I mean, the, the takeaway from that really is, what you were saying before, right, which is this is a person, and it's like another reminder that like Fisk is a dude who has a fully realized life. He's not just a a monster. Like he's a monster and also he's a person with a life and something he cares about. Mm. Nice little reminder. Uh yeah, like like we said, uh we then we then cut to Matt and Foggy, uh or Foggy, <laughs> Foggy's drinking alone, uh just really just having a bad time with the whole Fisk situation and Matt shows up and they have this little exchange where he said, Matt says, um, you know, he, he goes, Matt Murdoch isn't going to be a part of me. I'm leaving, I'm leaving him behind. The only reason I came here is to warn you and Karen that Fisk is out and you're in danger. Last night, everything became clear. I'm going after him. I'm going to find a way to take him down. It's a, it's a great Matt Murdoch moment. It is the most edge Lord thing Matt has ever said. I reckon. Yeah, I this, my my guy Matt should have been is not going to be a part of me anymore. That let is the trench so go. edgy. <laughs> yeah. It's it's very good. Um I also like the pincer trap that Foggy finds himself in. Where he's, he's not supposed to tell Karen, 
and he can't tell he can't tell Karen because Matt doesn't want Karen to know that he's alive. But he also can't tell Marcy because then you have to tell Marcy that Matt is dead. Matt was dead at all. You know, mm. it's it's like he's just he has no one to go to in this moment. Yeah. What 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 he does tell Karen though. He tells Karen the next episode, yeah. Yeah. But I mean that's after spending that's only after he's decided to be the DA, right? True. So right. it's only after he's found a direction to go in where he feels like he's got he's figured it out. He's figured it out to some extent. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanna cap off this episode by talking a little bit about genre because there's some mechanistic stuff um that that is happening here. Um, you, you said the kind of question, you, you brought up the question of like instability with Dex um, and, and with Matt as well. And there's a way that I think both of these characters um, are experiencing a kind of perversion of reality in pursuit of something, you know, unhealthy. For, for Dex, you know, he follows Julia and embodies this by stalking and consuming the same food as her. And by kind of, um, by making that, fantasy a reality by performing it to the therapist right it, it kind of um it kind of launders reality through that performance um to convince himself that it's it's a stable thing to do and it's it's fine matt is like the opposite right he's following fisk and the hallucination of fisk is performing the fantasy back to himself and f- what i think is a really subtle detail is that fisk addresses him as matthew not Daredevil, right? Or not the devil or not the devil of Hell's Kitchen, right? This is the fantasy being performed at the so-called dead part of Matt. It's not being performed to Daredevil, mm-hmm. who he keeps insisting is who he's becoming. Um, and, and I think for Matt, you know, as he chases Fisk and, and he sort of has the subversion of reality, or at least, at least we see it that way, this instability, I think it's, I think we're supposed to read it as it's Matt's mind kind of reeling from the fact that he is suppressing some nascent desire to still be Matt Murdock, right? That all of this is him um, trying to warp reality to suit this kind of martyrdom that he's placed himself in front of or has made him, you know, he's put himself on the cross for this thing and there's some part of him that is, like, not willing to to make that sacrifice because it wants to still be Matt Murdock. Yeah, I, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's just... As I said, it's, it's very personal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this for me is sort of, I guess, where I have questions about genre, right? Because if, if the question is like perversion of reality where Dex can't approach Julia because that will require like vulnerability and intimacy and Matt can't face Fisk for fear of like damning himself of losing any potential of vulnerability and intimacy by becoming the devil, you know, if if we talked in season two about the ways in which the comic book epic and the crime thriller were sort of echoing into each other here for me, it's sort of, it's like a psychological thriller with this kind of espionage genre almost um, where you've got two characters tracking targets for inverse reasons. Right. And that's a really mm. common espionage trope, especially in the kind of um, 60s, 70s when, when, you know, the, the, the kind of, serial um espionage genre became big that question of like well you you're tracking someone you know one guy's tracking the bad guy and the other guy's tracking um this person that that they that they wish they could have a relationship with uh it 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 creates some interesting questions to me about structurally where is the season going because like i said i don't have a clear memory but even just thinking about that stuff it, it makes me wonder if it really will be that question of like, you know, what will Dex do in order to feel that sense of belonging and intimacy? And will Matt take that step to destroy the possibility of that, of that vulnerability and intimacy? It's, it seems to me those are the two questions being set up. Yeah. It does feel like some sort of, uh, Seventies, eighties, police drama, kind of, um, like you know, kind of, you have mentally unstable people and uh, police investigations, and you know that kind of brings up like ideas of like heat or something like that. You know, I, I know that's the nineties, but you know, 
Yeah, but um, that, that noir uh, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I think mm. that is quite an app. Something, yeah. f- something for us to keep an eye on, I think. Yeah. Man, maybe it is more noir than, than espionage. That's interesting. I suppose because of the psychological mm. element, right? It's usually the key with, right. with noir. Yes, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's that question of the, the psychological jeopardy and, and that, that becomes mortal jeopardy for the protagonist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. Interesting. Okay, I mean, that's episode three. Uh, do you have anything else or should we, should we take a quick break? Uh, no, nope, that's it. All right, we will be right back after this to talk about episode four is very exciting blindsided we'll be back in a tick if you enjoy what we do the best way to support us is to head to underink.press and grab a t-shirt we have the daredevil in the details branded uh pocket tee uh we've got some main art trick shirts that have got kind of different phrases from each book um that are really cool you can head to underink.press grab a t-shirt uh, it helps support what we do you get some cool fashion threads uh, and these are sustainable heavyweight fabric. They're designed to last 10, 20 years. This is a t-shirt that you're going to buy and you're going to be able to wear for a very long time. You can head to underink.press to help support us. Otherwise, consider giving us a rating or a review on your podcast catcher or platform of choice. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, let's talk about episode four, Blindsided. It was written by Liwa Nasadin and directed by Alex Garcia Lopez. Could we please hear the summary, Pat? Foggy relays the previous evening to Marcy, who consoles him, and concludes that the safest way to remain safe from Fisk is to be as public as possible. Run for DA. Matt dons a, Matt dons a suit of another kind and uses Foggy's name to get into prison, hoping to see Vic, the head of the Albanians. At the bulletin, Foggy reveals that Matt is alive. Karen and Foggy head to Matt's apartment, only to find him missing this final lie redoubling Karen's efforts to stop Fisk. In prison, Matt is attacked by a doctor, drugged with something, before the phone rings and Fisk taunts him. Then, as a riot ensues, Matt must fight his way out of the prison, barely escaping with a lead and his life. Elsewhere, Dex is being investigated over discrepancies in his account of the motorcade attack. However, Fisk lies, claiming that the final men were armed, corroborating Dex's false declaration. In a tag, Matt wakes up in a taxi as an unknown driver bails out and the locked cab plunges into the New York River. Not a lot of plot in this episode. I, I, yeah, I don't have a lot written down for this episode. I'll say that. No, um, it kind of whizzes yeah. past you, I think. Mm. I mean, a big part of that is because about six minutes is taken out by a one so that's like another... <laughs> that's yes. a, a big part of it. I mean, I, I ended up having some some stuff just that's ricocheted off last episode is really where I ended up here. You know, mm. we... Uh, it's, it's just some other character details I really like. We open the episode with um, Fisk waking up and kind of getting out of bed. And Dex and his buddies sort of storm in, hoping to wake him up and, and rouse him and, like you said, humiliate him. Uh, but Fisk is already sort of standing and facing the wall. And... You know, there's sort of this particular compliance that Fisk has that Dex sort of like, it seems like Dex doesn't know how to place it, right? There's a way you could imagine him thinking of it as like arrogance, but then also like respect where he's like, but this guy's actually doing the right thing. Like it, it seems to me that Dex has, is really struggling to understand what to do with Fisk, you know, how to, how to perceive him. Well, I think from Dex's perspective, he, he, the reason he wants to humiliate Fisk probably is to reinforce slash fit in to this role that he's, you know, uh, told, told himself that um, he is an, a, a decorated, you know, government of, uh, agent. Um, that's, what, that's what all the government agents do. This, this dude is the enemy of the FBI and therefore, you know, treating him like dirt is... You know, it re- reinforces his place uh, in in the FBI, um, and then from Fisk's perspective, um, complying uh, with you know with these antics that the FBI are getting up to, c- complying with them with dignity and um, uh, dignity and composure. Uh, I think the effect that creates is something akin to. <laughs> 
this is going to sound quite random, but something akin to like uh, these like right wing personalities targeting young men, kind of, you know, like, you know, t- taking all this hate and stride and, you know, keeping your head held high and stuff like that. And I, I kind of think there's like a similar vibe going on. What, what do you reckon? I have written in my notes, this is the beginning of the radicalization for Dex. So you've mm. you've completely seen where my head is at here. Yeah, it's yeah. it's the same um yeah, it's it's the same energy of like this this guy is like an untouchable stone in a storm and Dex's entire life is a storm, right? You know, and yeah. there's there's a yeah. there's a there's an envy that exists for that kind of stability. Um this like I said before, you know, this question of like it seems to Dex that, f- or it seems to us as well that Fisk has somehow solved reality. Um, you you talk about that question of like radical, you know, uh, what does this mean, right? That these kind of right wing figures are able to to push young men in this direction. You know, if if you think about it, it's this desire to remove all the ambiguity from reality because ambiguity is scary because the truth of life is that it's chaos and the numbers are really big and stuff happens all the time that doesn't necessarily make sense. And Fisk represents a version of reality where that isn't the case for Dex, where things are solved. And, and, and if he just set, if he just does what Dex tells, uh, what Fisk says, um, perhaps that's a, that's a way out of the ambiguity, right? You think about the ways that, um, you know, that the, the flat earth conspiracy and the QAnon conspiracy, they, they all exist to try and, um, titrate reality into like a a single explainable thing right Uh, a unifying theory that justifies and and encapsulates everything that that has no outliers and that's part of why they work so well these temple conspiracies because evidence against them becomes evidence incorporated for them right they're like impenetrable in that sense because they're designed to like make you have to not think about the fact that not everything makes sense and good things and bad things happen for sometimes no reason. And, uh, and, and it's big and complicated and scary. And it just, it provides that level of comfort and to have an individual in your orbit, when you ask someone like Dex who can exude that energy, it, it is a hundred percent reaching for the same levers. And, and of course I already said this, you know, but, but temporally, um, this is in 2018. So, it would it would seem unlikely to me that this is sort of uh this is not something that is top of mind for literally everyone at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a really good observation. Also, the most contemporary, probably like the most contemporary topic the show has looked at so far. Yeah, you know, in in the yeah, in, the, so, yeah. in the same way that f- the fake news line from Nadim stood out to me last episode. I was like, oh, mm. that's a contemporary kind of turn of phrase, you know, I, I think it places this episode in a, in a time and place in history, which I don't think is a bad thing. I just think it's noteworthy. Yeah. Yeah. We then, I mean, uh, we, we then get one of my uh, sequences I actually really like, which is foggy freaking out. He's, he's wigging out. Foggy's just, just he's stressing. Um, and we get, I said this last season and I'll keep saying it. Their relationship is so interesting to me. Um, it's so it's so simple, you know. So much of the show what, foggy is foggy and Marcy. Foggy and Marcy, yeah, yeah. So much of the show is so complicated, and their relationship just seems to be simple, and it just seems to work, right? Mm-hmm. There's something really, I don't know, heartening to see a show that is as complicated and dire as this to be like, here's a one, here's one that's working, <laughs> here's a good one. Well, I, I, it's because uh, previously they, you know, they had this off again on again kind of turbulent relationship supposedly because they were either one or both of them were finding themselves you know they were putting on acts saying things that they didn't believe and now that they're a bit older a bit more mature they've just dropped all that pretense and can live as as sort of earnest sincere people together is Mm. is the kind of vibe i get from their relationship yeah 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 and you know marcy has the fucking galaxy brain take of like well, he can't kill you if you're in the fucking public. So why don't you run <laughs> yeah. for DA? <laughs> yeah, it's. So... I, I, that's a that's a quite a um refreshing disposition to have from a from a female love interest. I feel like because the trope is always 
um the the male wants to do something brash and dangerous and then the you know the woman's always like oh no are you going to get yourself killed whereas uh, i think this is quite a refreshing twist on that where marcy's all she almost does seems to not care if he <laughs> if he puts himself in danger and you know like real danger um but yeah as you said like you know it's it is quite a sensible thing to do and, and it works out so that, like that's it. also their dispositions though right you know marcy's a prosecutor and foggy's a defense attorney right you know they yeah. they just naturally and and perhaps that's why they work so well is they kind of balance each yeah. other out right yes yeah. Yeah, she, she has that great line where she says if you're if you're already a target you may as well take a swing yeah which is a, um, a really great line and foggy's hair looks really good in this scene as well he he i don't his long hair someone they should have never given him long hair it looks horrible on him they've really nailed it this season yeah yeah it's it's a it's a really good look for him and it gives him I, especially when they put him in like proper grown-up suits it, it really yeah. gives him yeah. the right energy that, that we're looking for here yes yeah i think it, it helps uh there's a there's a saying in uh, hairdressing which is like does it look good when you wake up in the morning, if so, that means you've done a probably a good job if it's like a shortcut. And Foggy has mm-hmm. that. Like, you can tell it's a good haircut. Yes. So, speaking of Foggy, <laughs> Matt uses his ID, right? Is this the next scene? I can't remember. This is just the next scene I've written down, at least. Yeah, I think so. Because um, uh, after he says, what's your name? Oh, Franklin Nelson. And then it cuts to the opening credits. So, yeah. Yes, there you go. Yeah, so he, um, yeah, he's, Matt has Foggy's wallet, which we now realize that he needed for the, um, the bar association license and perhaps cash. And I'm still trying to piece together in my head what, like, what his goal is. Um, and then he, he reveals it pretty quickly when he meets with one of their old clients, which is that he wants to speak with Mick, the head of the, Al- uh, sorry, Vic, the head of the Albanians. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, and then he gets punched and oh, oh yeah, no, sorry, he's you're right. He says the thing. We cut to credits, um, and then then he's inside, has the conversation. Then he gets punched, and they're like, "Hey, we need you to fill out this form." And then we're back to Nadim at the FBI, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because man, talk about like just continuing to fucking run this guy through the ringer. So Nadim's at work again. His only big break of his entire career. And his kid can't sleep because he's worried about dad. Like, and his his wife doesn't blame him, but you can tell that, like, she's frustrated. And it's like, his, the second his work goes well, like, the second he gets a, 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 a something good at work, it breaks bad immediately. And even though it goes bad, he manages to hold on to it. And it's still a good thing, but even then he can't catch a break. Like, he just, there is no, there are no right answers for Nadim. <laughs> yeah. Poor dude. Yeah. I mean, I said in our first episode that he's like caged rat energy, but I, I want to correct that, which is it's it's not caged rat. It's rat in a maze energy, right? There's just like there are mm. no correct turns. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, it, it is kind of absurdly funny how he keeps making the wrong decisions. Yeah. Um, And there's a, I don't know if it's this scene or the one after, but or one later on, but um you know when they're uh when they're doing the interviewing fisk for the uh dex's case and you know they nadine goes out to pretty much like tell dex that they're investigating him it's like you know it's 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 a it's a noble thing because you know he's trying to repay the dude that saved his life but it's the wrong decision it's the wrong choice <laughs> it's man like, he oh, keeps doing it it's this is like the first domino falling is this moment i mean plus mm. right like I also really like that his wife completely misreads him in this moment where, you know, she's sort of saying, you know, Sammy can't sleep or whatever. And she says, she, the exact line I think she says is she says, I know how much this promotion means to you. And Nadim just breezes past it because it means nothing to Nadim. What it means is that he might get paid more so he can get out from under the debt. Like it's, it's such a, um, it's such a great, moment of i guess like it's it's if if everyone you know like you said he, he makes a mistake with um uh with dex later this is also a mistake of him not correcting his wife and being like i don't care about the job like i'm doing this for you and sammy 
this is the moment where he should say that and he can't because he's at work and if someone overhears him say that it's going to be a problem you know and it's it's a it's yeah, do, you know, yeah. do you know what i'm trying to say um uh what that he, he's trying to as as in like he he is trying to place himself in a role where he seems like he does want to have a promotion and sort of be a good F agent and stuff like that but when that's not really not the case is that what you're saying well that's not the motivation right she sort of says you know i understand how much getting this promotion means to you but like it does like the promotion is it's a means to an end right it's it's so right. he can pay off this debt and provide for his family well i, I don't know I, I i think he does seem to have really bought in to the institution that he's in mm -hmm. um so uh yes yeah, yeah his main motivator i reckon is to try and get out of debt but his wife's concern is not at all i reckon like unwarranted i think a concern is that um not that he's get he's trying to get the promotion but that he's in too invested in his work which i think would mm. be true either way if he was trying to get a promotion or not um, okay, but yeah. in, in this particular case, his work is dealing with very, very dangerous people, um, which is why she's sort of upset. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay, I can see that. I mean, and, and also, like, salt in the wound that it's um, his wife's sister's place, too. It's just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> the, the very same person who, whose cancer treatment is like, God damn, dude, you cannot. Oh, yeah. Uh, just brutal <laughs> irony. Um taking l's left and right yeah uh anyway i i think it's a really interesting exchange i'd be curious to see what people think of that actually because i i like your reading a lot uh and, and but i i also i think you're absolutely right which is like it doesn't matter what the motivation is she's still right um but the fact that he doesn't correct her or challenge her is the mistake for him in this moment the fact that he yeah. doesn't he the fact that he doesn't repeat what he said in the first episode which is like i'm doing this for for you and Sammy, you know, that's the, that's the tragedy of Nadim. Like you said, is that he just can never make the right choice when it matters. Mm. Yeah. It's unfortunate dude. I think the next thing I have here is that foggy tells Karen that Matt's still alive, both at the bulletin. And then they go to Matt's apartment. Uh, you know, and foggy also is like, I think it's where he tells her I'm running for DA or something as well. Um, I don't have a lot here because there's not a lot that happens other than it seems to galvanize Karen to to keep investigating. Um, yeah, I uh, there's not much going on in those scenes. I thought. Yeah, just plot moving forward. It's uh, which is fine sometimes. So then Mac gets trapped in the prison, and he has to do a big time wanna to get out of there. The one is mm -hmm. cool. I have a look to say a few things to say about that, but also um, I've written down, okay, let's play thematic guess who. So in a st okay, this is a story where the good guys are fighting to put the bad guy back in prison. And then our main good guy gets trapped in prison by the guy that they're trying to put back in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've written in my notes. Um, symmetry. Not sure what this means. Um, <laughs> Symmetry. I was like, I don't know what this is. I mean, I guess it's just straightforward parallelism, but um, I, you know, perhaps dramatic irony or something like that um, at play here that he has to fight his way out of prison is, is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a good pickup. Not sure what, I, 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 what, what I, it produces. I do see though. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, same. Like it's there, mm. and I and I don't know which thread to pull on to make it mean something, but it is it is certainly yeah. happening. I mean, okay, here we go. If Nadim is trapped by circumstance, right? If you, you think about prison as like the uh, in, in the kind of metaphysical sense, right? Nadim is continually trapped by circumstance. Matt is trapped by himself and his personality, um, and. Fisk is the only one who isn't trapped because he is seemingly in control even in this moment. Mm -hmm. And so there's something there about like, you know, uh, oh, sorry, no, Fisk is, Fisk is in prison constantly 
because he's in because lo- of his love for Vanessa. Mm-hmm. So he's trapped by love. Yeah. Matt is trapped by a sense of duty. Um, Nadim is trapped by circumstance. Uh, Foggy is trapped by being unfortunate enough to be friends with Matt. Um, and Karen is trapped by her past. You know what I mean? It's all yeah. in the mix. It's all one big prison. Mm. The season is a metaphor for prison. It's, it's a metaphor about prisons and the keys that <laughs> unlock them, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> the prison is a metaphor for prison. <laughs> Brilliant. Bravo. That's actually what they don't tell you when you do a writing degree is how important um, prison metaphors are in yeah. structural storytelling. Mm-hmm. If you want to if you want to build a prison, you need to start with a prison that's actually about a different type of prison. So, the structure of story is just a prison of ideas you think about. In it. some in some ways, aren't all stories just prisons? Yeah. Mm, something to think <laughs> about. There is some really cool stuff. Um, you know, Matt has to fight through a bunch of these inmates. It's, it's, a, it's a, about a four-minute wanna before we get a cut. And it's, you know, the, the opening sequence is probably the scrappiest we've seen for a minute in this show. Mm-hmm. I think in no small part because he's not wearing a mask, so it is probably Charlie Cox doing a lot of the some of the stunts himself that's my suspicion I, I did see a behind the scenes of this once actually and um i remember the, there's a, the bit where um they're fighting out in the hallway and then um they stumble back into the room or like one of them like suplexes matt back into the the room yeah i think that that somewhere there's a transition between a stuntman and, and charlie cox i remember mm, okay there yeah. you go yeah Pretty yeah, cool. he, he kind of gets uh, he gets the shit kicked out of him for a minute, and then and then in that in that room where the doctor was, he goes like absolute beast mode at the end, where he just like he just takes down like four guys instantly. It's it's a really cool little bit of action, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and but he's he's clearly fucked up because he's been drugged with something, and so he's sort of woozy and he's really struggling to keep his feet and to kind of keep conscious. Takes out some dudes with nightsticks in full armor, just kind of wild, kind of <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> The lockdown starts and there's like sirens and people are throwing flame and stuff and it's all just, it's all kicking off. It's kind of absurd how much anarchy there is. <laughs> it's like, like, what happened? What, what, are, what is everyone else thinking? What, what is going on in this, like, you well, know? Pre- presumably this is Fisk's design, right? Is he needs to cover up this murder by having all of the prisoners start a riot. So I'm assuming yeah, that yes. this is instigated by... His man. Right. I actually have I, I have a, I have a bunch of questions about like did Fisk know who Matt was prior to this? Was he expecting Foggy? Um did when he gave this the ID did then someone notify Fisk and then he put the plan into action to get, you know, supposedly Foggy into the uh into the med room so they could drug him or whatever. I think the moment he knows is when Matt shows up on the CCTV in the visitor room. Yeah. That's when yeah, Fisk Yeah, so he finds, out, he finds out in pretty much in, in, real time. in and around this moment, yeah. yeah. But he seems to have I, con- I think you could- contingencies in place for the Albanians that maybe aren't directly about Matt. Right, yeah, yeah. Because I, I kind of think you could, or you could easily misconstrue this thing. You could easily construe this scene- as uh, Fisk knew already knew that Matt was Daredevil and and he was sort of waiting for him, um, because there's that so there's that bit beat in uh, season two after Matt punches Wilson he goes hmm get me the file on Matt Murdock or whatever mm. yeah it's, it's my supposition is that he doesn't know and that this is sort of one of the things about Fisk that is like he in this moment he doesn't know yet. One of the things to me that is that is a really um, compelling aspect about Fisk is the same thing that makes someone like Palpatine an interesting villain in the Clone Wars cartoon, right? Is the, the, these are villains who, to everyone else, seem like they have these Machiavellian like contingencies in place and everything appears planned, but really a lot of it is like doing a lot of prep work to be prepared for a lot of situations and making the right call in the moment. And this reads mm. to me as... Um, as he Fisk must know that someone is going to go to the Albanians at some point to try and get information about why they were hit. 
And that revelation, which Vic is aware of, that we learn here, which I didn't include in the summary, is that Fisk had himself shanked in prison and in such a way that was convincing enough to convince the feds to let him out. And so this is the mm-hmm. reveal that he sprung himself in an absolute lunatic maneuver by getting someone to shank him. And the dude that shanked him, Jasper, got out thanks to Fisk's paperwork. And so Matt's mm-hmm. lead is, I'm going to go track down this Jasper character. But presumably Fisk knows that's a, that's a point of vulnerability. He flipped on the Albanians the second to get out of prison. So he knows that they're going to want to rat him out to somebody. And so he must put this contingency in place at some point. And also just from season one, we kind of know that most people in the police or a lot of people in these institutions are in some capacity or used to be on his payroll. And maybe he's reworking those same machinations. It's a, um, uh, (laughs) The word I'm looking for. Um, it's a pathology. One one in five people yeah. paid for paid by Fisk. Well, also he was the, the king of this New prison, York. right? That's the other thing. Was it this one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because where the Albanians oh, okay, are. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the other thing, right? Is he used to be? In, it's, yeah. He was in charge here until they they let him out. Yeah. No. Yeah, that all makes sense to me. All right, that checks out. Yeah. Um, what in that phone call as well? I think this is the exact same transaction as they had in season one where Matt goes, listen to me very carefully, and then Fisk hangs up. Isn't that exactly how it goes in the when he's yes. getting the Russian guy out? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's a, which normally works for Matt, right? That's his daredevil maneuver. He's like, listen here very carefully, and people are like, oh shit. And Fisk is like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, I got everything I need. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good sequence. You know, Matt sort of, uh, he, yeah, after he gets the information from Vic, one of Vic's dudes dresses up like a guard and they sort of, um, they, it's, it's a really like fraught kind of escape where they kind of stumble out together, fighting people off as they get attacked. There's at one point where they're like walking through a gate and there's a guard being shanked in the neck multiple times. It's just really yeah. gnarly. <laughs> it's a gnarly sequence. It's- that's what I mean. It's so chaotic, like absurdly yeah. chaotic. It's so funny. Yeah. Um. And there's like, and they go outside and there's people like right, like next to the exit gate, like the prisoners and stuff. It's like, what the fuck? Like, you're right, this is like the, the worst managed prison I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, it would be, it's run by a fucking criminal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the other, the other, uh, the other detail I really like is the, there's so much action going on in the background that if you watch this again, there's all just like kind of interesting fight stuff occurring like all around it that you can kind of look yeah. at and be like, oh, that's real. Like they've really thought this. It's a really well thought through sequence. Although this, this time around, I, I sort of had deliberately didn't look around because I, I did that in my last watch and I noticed a lot of very wide punches, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. yeah. So I, <laughs> I'm just... It's like, oh, you know, I didn't see that. Well the, well, the camera does a good job of keeping your attention there, right? Which is the thing that's always in yeah, center yeah. frame is it's, it's, it's either them doing, it's either them fighting, you know, someone's fighting someone or it's Matt and the dude grabbing each other's, like the collar, you know, Matt's grabbing the dude's back and then the, the guy's got his sort of hand around Matt's suit jacket collar. And just them kind of yeah. like dragging each other through the situation, neither of them being in control, I think is such a, a choice thing for us here. It you is. Know, it's so scrappy, that. I love it. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, it's just a bad situation. Like, it's this, it's <laughs> yeah. a, and it feels like at any second, it could, it could be a, it, you know, that could be it. One misstep and you're done. Right, exactly. And what I was saying much earlier about um, becoming numb to some of the, the things in this season, this is one of them. The fact that m- this is just Matt Murdock without a mask, you know. Yeah. Um, and his, you know, he's, he's been ousted. Um, it's, there's, there's a peril here that I think for people watching the, this the first time that it'll, it would really heighten the, the suspense and the drama. I reckon I I certainly felt that way the first time I watched this. I was like, oh shit. Like it's all, it's all come crumbling down. Like they know, (laughs) they know who Matt is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's the other thing, right? Is like now the Albanians (laughs) have him on their list too. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's really exposed himself in this maneuver, but it, but there's no other play. Right, that's the thing mm. f- from his perspective. Right, is this is the last card that he has, 
And it's in some ways this, you know, this is the desperation for Matt is like, I have to make this work because if I can't bring him down using this, I'm going to have to kill him. Hmm. And so it's that, that, that desperation, which is maybe pacing wise a little early for this season, but um, I mean, it works. It's a great episode. I mean, you say that now, but I think <laughs> you just wait like the, the, the peril, they somehow keep upping the peril in like in the as the episodes go on okay somehow and it's yeah, I believe it's really you. impressive yeah all right, all right. i get i get you uh so after this uh we then get the uh, <laughs> what i've written down here is the world's most depressing cheeseburger um <laughs> which it was sad before dex it. took a bite but then it gets even it's <laughs> like it's 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 so grim it's like a hotel cheeseburger which if you've ever had a hotel cheeseburger don't and it's literally just <laughs> It seems like cold bun and potentially cold patty, some pretty bad looking chips, and then a little thing of tomato sauce, a little thing of ketchup. Mm. Um, and it's such a great scene because, you know, Dex takes a bite out of it being like, I'm a fuck, this is going to be great. And <laughs> this sits down and he uses the spork to like cut around the bite mark and then eats the burger with a spork. And, mm. you know, Dex is like, that was not the result I was hoping for. Who eats a burger with a spork? Like, it's such an iconic <laughs> line. It's a great little choice for me. I yeah. like it. Plus that dignity, th- like you said before, that dignity or that control or that sort of mastery of reality is, is here again. Just to rub it in Dex's face, right? There's nothing he can do to, to rile this guy up. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> he's constantly putting on a performance. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, at all times. Okay, this is the scene I wanted to talk about, which I don't think makes it into a show that gets made now. Which is Foggy crashes the police union meeting. Mm-hmm. Now, in reality, police unions like this are a problem. Um, there's there's a big conversation that, that obviously happened in, in the wake of uh, the years following when this show came out about policing um, and what it means that there is this kind of uh, cop culture, as it's called in America, um, where it's just like super insular, like we're all doing the right thing. It's everyone else. that's the problem. Um, And I think if this show were made now, I I can't imagine this scene being included in the way it is. Um, Or or even I mean, obviously the depiction of policing would be completely different if included in the same way at all. Um, But this scene specifically to me would be very, very different. Um, and it's also not realistic. Foggy will get thrown out at the second that you're not a cop, you're a problem for them, especially mm. as a defense attorney. Um, so that, I mean, the show has its cake and eats it too, but, but this is certainly a, um, a scene that would be drastically different if made today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the TLDR is that Foggy basically launches his writing campaign with the police because he knows that, uh, that they are sort of the first people to want Fisk to be gone. Seems like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And also, they have that relationship with Tower, right? Because he's the DA. Uh, who, who does? Foggy does. They're police. Because they, they, they ostensibly work oh, for the DA, right? right? right, right. You know, that's, that's how the yeah, right, police right. is structured in America. Yeah. So he's basically having a go at their boss, being like, your boss let out your worst enemy, kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we get a fucking wild Karen scene that I want to touch on briefly just to call it out where she is walking home and this is after she's kind of blown up about Matt to Foggy. She's walking home and these dudes like cat calling people coming by and um, and she, you know, she walks straight up to him, pulls a pistol and scares the absolute shit out of them. Um, you know, that, that need for control, that, that need to like, like, I don't know what we're supposed to take from this. I don't, I don't know. What, what do you think about what this is? Well, this is doing she's looking for a fight which is not dissimilar to matt so and in the other way she's not dissimilar to matt is her obsession over fisk Mm -hmm. so i think it's like just drawing like a a whole lot of parallels between karen and matt this season yeah 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 and being being the one that gets to make people afraid right yeah and she yeah she really pulls off this kind of you said unstable before, and this is like, it's the same kind of energy. It's just like, these are people who are desperate to 
fix this thing and they need an outlet for that kind of frustration, that anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually, the thing about outlets, that's interesting. Yeah. Because that's a thing that a lot of these characters, that uh, the the show explores for a lot of these characters is outlets. And that's going to be particularly pivotal to a certain character in a bit. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. I mean, I and I, I think the the thing it's it's putting in mind for me is it's like you either have to work through and accept who you are, or you're gonna constantly be suppressing stuff and it's gonna come out in these spasms of violence, right? Um mm. we we talked a lot about Fisk in season one and this just like this zero to one hundred instantly that happens where it's like this this animal is always just below the surface, right? Um, you have Dex's outlet of of stalking Julia is his way of sort of keeping uh, the the lights on and the the water running sort of thing. Uh, and then you you have sort of a, a similar thing with Matt, you know, obviously needing to go go out and beat people to a pulp. Uh, and then you have you have Foggy, um, seemingly the only one immune to this to an extent. Um, but even him, you know, his his outlet for this seems to be just getting drunk alone um, and stressing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. What's what's also fascinating is we don't know what Nadim's is yet. That's the other thing that's kind of interesting to me. So we haven't really seen well, a lot of Nadim's interiority yet. Yeah, true. I mean, I I would argue that that's his work. His right. All all his problems revolve around him being a good FBI agent. So yeah. Yeah, and in some ways using that to avoid dealing with his life. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Actually, I actually hadn't thought about that. Which is also interesting because the scene we get afterwards is him talking to um, Hadley uh, and he sort of says, like, I don't know what to do, man. Like, Sammy's misleading. He basically relays the information. And she says, the lies that keep us safe are the ones worth telling, which is a really compelling line in this moment that is going to... This advice from Hadley is going to my suspicion is this is the moment where Nadim goes from having a road back to wherever he ends up this is the moment where like the his mentor in this moment right in work this space right his mentor says hey the lies to keep us safe are the ones worth telling basically encouraging him to continue behaving the way that he does to his family keeping them in the dark yeah. keeping them at arm's length and there's something we maybe don't know about her motivation for saying this um, but I suspect that if this advice was different and if Hadley was not who she is, his life could have gone a different way. You know, this, this is a that's, tipping point for him. That's a very good point because, yeah, a lot of the consequences uh, that occur later on in the season are due to um, people like Ray keeping things close to the chest and not really telling anybody. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. Very good. Mm. Yeah, secrets and such. You guys get it. <laughs> then, uh, then, okay. So then we get the 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 Fisk reveal, right? The kind of the kind of coup d'état to Fisk kind of uh, working decks in a certain sense, which is, uh, like you said before, um, this is just after that. This is the moment after Nadim says to. Dex, hey, it would be incredibly unprofessional of me to tell you that they're looking into you and that there's a discrepancy. Dex then uh, gets the room to himself and goes and watches the tape of Fisk being asked by Internal Affairs what happened. Um, and Fisk lies and says that the Albanians were armed. And it's a great moment because then Fisk looks dead into the recording camera. <laughs> sort of presupposing. But it's, it's, here's the genius of this maneuver from Fisk, right? If Dex doesn't watch this footage, there's no L to be taken, right? There's, it, it's not going to disrupt his plan. But on the off chance Dex does watch the footage, it hits so hard, right? It, mm. it's, he, he, if this works, he knows he has Dex's number. He knows he's got him mm. figured out. And if not, he can keep, keep searching. It's such a, like, it's a, there's no, it's a, it's a no loss move from Fisk in this moment. Do you imagine if like for anybody else watched that though? I'd be pretty suspicious. Like, why why is he like, looking why is into he the camera? That? Yeah, what, <laughs> what the are you fuck? doing? 
<laughs> what is this yeah. guy doing? But then that also no, speaks is, to like how much footage they're recording, right? Like no one's reviewing all this shit. Yes. Yeah. But it's also weird that they would just have that footage lying around, like, and they, and they would even have recorded that in the first place if it was meant to be secret. Uh, well, it's, but it it's, it's his com- testimony. Confidential. It's his testimony, right? Yeah, but I surely they would just take in like a, their own little recording device. Um, yeah, that's probably yeah. Hey, but it makes for a great <laughs> scene, so yeah, it does. Can't be mad. It does. <laughs> yeah, I we- also i i didn't think the surrendering Albanians was going to be a huge plot point. I completely forgot about this. <laughs> yeah, apparently well, it's quite important. Because what happens is right. Um, he kills all of them. He kills like all of them except two, pretty much like handily. Right? He's yeah ricocheting bullets he's doing this at the fifth thing um and the last two guys surrender and he <laughs> he just he executes them hmm. um and then yeah um has clearly lied about it in his report and then fisk yeah corroborates that lie and says yeah it was self-defense they were armed which they weren't yeah yeah it is weirdly like pervasive this season how much this is coming up yeah and i i guess the the way this kind of resolves right the way that Fisk kind of plays his final card here is Dex storms in having you know realized this and he's like I don't need any favors from you convict Fisk is like look I you know he says the world is changing the real heroes are ridiculed and dismissed and for that I offer my sympathy and this is what you were saying before for me this is that moment of the radicalization right where Fisk is subtly being like, it's us and them, buddy. You know, the, the real heroes are being ridiculed. Uh, the real heroes, you and me, pal, we're being ridiculed and dismissed. And, you know, I, I feel badly about that. You know, you have my sympathy. I get it because I'm there with you, bud. And it's that mm. subtle repositioning to, to align them to the same perspective. Yeah. Yeah, great. Great stuff. Really just a clean... Fisk knowing what's up and it's just a clean way to like kind of put an underline through that and be like, okay, now he's, now he's mine to do with what I will. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we said this, I don't have much to say about it, but we get a weird code. Actually, no, I do. I have a complaint. The, the tag we get yeah. is Matt wakes up in a locked car, dude bails out. And it's like, this kind of cliffhanger always irks me because it's clearly done so that you'll watch the next episode. It's not for any particular purpose. <laughs> yeah. This could have it's been like, the opening of the next episode, like before the credits. Yeah, I mean, is it is that really meant to lead to something? Like, are we actually gonna believe that, like, you know, Matt drowns or is gonna get trapped at the bottom of the lake or something like that? Yeah, exactly. No, I don't think so. Like, yeah, it's a bit yeah. arbitrary. Yeah. And he's not gonna learn anything about himself by getting out of a <laughs> car in the river. Like, you know, it just doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, it's it's like the. Like the Walking Dead um, cliffhangers, yes. yeah. Which they do so much. <laughs> they, hit, they hit a point after season eight, and they're like, every third episode must have a cliffhanger. <laughs> and it gets exhausting. Yeah. You want to like, know how to do cliffhangers? Watch Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Oh, I'll dude, say. The cliffhangers in Better Call Saul are like agonizing. Because <laughs> they're like they're like character cliffhangers about yeah. like. Yeah, someone morality someone but. makes a choice and then you have to sit and watch the credits and be like oh my yeah. god like yeah those are the best yeah you sit in the you sit and sit in the filth of it and be like god damn <laughs> <laughs> uh <laughs> sit in the filth of it that is <laughs> as a filthy way of describing art david no yeah man it. hey i'm not saying the art's filthy i'm saying the choices that people make you know? <laughs> mucking up their souls man getting down in the dirt you know what i'm saying mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, better call show soul that's a uh, better call show so, mm. better call soul <laughs> show at some point don't you worry about that it seems inevitable it's that's that's how that's uh you me and mitchy that's our destiny right there oh yeah well I, speaking of which i just released a new video recently yeah uh, the, which uh we should go check do you want out. To tell the people <laughs> yeah we uh released a Breaking Bad plus Better Call Saul theories tier list video yeah. uh, where we discuss fan theories about both shows. Um, some good, some bad, uh, and it's pretty interesting. Walter never had cancer. <laughs> what is that cancer. about? Wait, where is that one? Down oh, the bottom. Yeah. 
Walter never had cancer. All right. So um, this one is the theory that he paid off all the um, the doctors that diagnosed him with cancer. So essentially, like, you know how his motivations to, <laughs> yeah. to start making meth were, um, you know, it was a number of things. It was the cancer that was sort of the catalyst, but it was, you know, his feelings of, like, resentment and, yep. you know, uh, like not having accomplished much in his life and stuff like that. Yep. So I guess this theory is that, like, it's all those other reasons that are not cancer that he he started to make meth and then he he faked a, di- a cancer diagnosis in order to justify it to his family. Um, but, okay, but don't we see, like... <laughs> Like, isn't, isn't when he's told in the first episode, his family's not even there. Yeah. You know, know. by the guy that has a little mustard stain on his, uh, on his, uh, doctor's coat. Yeah. So I don't know. That one's not convincing me. No, this, this is one of the worst (laughs) ones, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. Some of them, uh, some of them I was like, I don't, the Walt never having cancer one. Um, that's terrible. I just like, yeah, some of them are real bad. Um, I, I like the way that you kind of um, you constructed a, a way to rank them, and then about halfway through, Mitchie just starts being like, "That one's good, that one's bad." Like it just, <laughs> it's really. That's funny. how it always goes, though. Like, I know. You just I drop know. the criteria halfway through, yeah. That and and you guys just well, actually this this video is not coming. This episode won't be out for like nine months, probably, with the way the release schedule is at the moment. But yeah, actually, um, that's true. You know the the uh, the gladiator episode you guys did just dropped as well, which is really fun. Oh yeah, it's Pat in his element talking about. Uh, Rome and history and stuff and just being on you were just on one that episode you like had it all on lock it was it was really <laughs> really entertaining I kept wanting to delay that episode because I wanted to like do a bunch of research and I'm glad I did that, yeah yeah that episode turned out pretty good yeah it's 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 a it's a real good one uh, look I mean you guys already know about a method to the madness but Pat where can they find it on the internet uh, you can find us on YouTube Spotify Apple Podcasts stitcher and soundcloud uh we have a website amttm.com you can find our socials from there i've noticed that um and i I put this on the gladiator episode you say and stitcher and mitchy says or stitcher and i don't know what to make of that (laughs) (laughs) i don't know either yeah just the duality of man eh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> look uh you guys you guys know the deal zero and done uh we can't do this without uh patreon support uh it really helps us keep the lights on helps us do the stuff we do we don't do any advertising except outside except inside our own network and the stuff that we love so uh, we appreciate any word of mouth that you can give us uh if you send a show to someone you think might like it otherwise consider giving it a comment a rating or a review rather you consume next episode we are covering daredevil season three episode five and episode six so that's episode five, the perfect game, uh, and episode six, the devil you know. And um, we finally have Stephen Sergic returning to direct an episode. So interested to Yay. see what that ends up being. But he's back. That'll do it. Uh, thank you so much for watching or listening. I'm actually really excited to kind of get into the meat of this season, which I feel like is is coming up pretty quickly. Um, and then uh start to think about a lot of what we've set up right so these questions of like outlets these questions of what's the primary thing matt is going through so lots to talk about this season uh that'll do it for this episode we will catch you next time uh hope you enjoyed and you know it if you're in the fbi and wilson fisk starts to get in your head maybe take a sick day (laughs) maybe report it to hr yeah, call, hey, tell your boss and be like, hey, um, boss man, <laughs> this guy's make, he's freaking me out. The prisoner's trying to radicalize me again. <laughs> the, the prisoner's trying to make me believe in QAnon, boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lesson we could all learn. <laughs> okay, we'll catch you guys next time. All right.